What's up guys, Justin Morgan here, and today we are talking about the 2017 American Diabetes Association Standards of Practice. Now the standards of practice are primarily written for healthcare practitioners, whether that be doctors, nurses, dietitians, those types of people that will actually be giving education to people with diabetes. So I use these though when I go in to speak to patients because it's a reliable source of information to pass on um, uh, just general practice. So they are the standards of practice um, and so they are something that is very reliable to use. Frequently when I go into rooms to speak to people that have had previous diabetes education from a nurse however, what they will generally tell me is that well the nurse told me I need to eat more meat and less carbs. And if it were that simple, then America would have abolished diabetes a long time ago. And unfortunately, those are actually not very good practices and they are not congruent with the 2017 or any other previous year standards of practice from the American Diabetes Association. So hopefully if you guys know nurses or people that have that mindset or those types of unfounded, unsupported beliefs, then maybe you could pass this video along to them so that they will stop giving out poor information to patients that are actually seeking to improve their health. So I'm going to put up on the screen for you guys to look at what I'm reading off of and what I'm discussing. And these are starting on, this is the abridged version. Uh, it's actually not the full version. This version is actually 22 pages and a lot of it covers things that nurses would have to look for or things that they care. So I'm only going to focus in on pages 7 and 8 and those will cover both the dietary and um, exercise recommendations from the American Diabetes Association. So I'll put that up for you to look at now. If you are looking at the page, I'm going to focus in on the section that says energy balance first. You guys are more than welcome to go read through the whole thing. I would encourage you to do that. But um, the first, the only bullet point under the section titled energy balance says modest weight loss achievable by the combination of reduction of calorie intake and lifestyle modification benefits overweight or obese adults with type 2 diabetes and also those with prediabetes. Intervention programs to facilitate this process are recommended. So the number one thing that they kind of recommend that one could do to help either alleviate or re, um, reverse type 2 diabetes is to actually just lose weight and generally that will facilitate that. Um, Obesity is, by and large, the number one contributor to, to diabetes, and diabetes is a pretty serious disease, at least for Americans. Um, so, you know, just the overall recommendation of losing weight is actually a pretty good one. Um, but going on, the next one goes on to actual eating patterns, and I'll throw that up. It says, eating patterns and macronutrient distribution. Because there, and bullet point one, because there is no single ideal dietary distribution of calories among carbohydrates, fats, and proteins for people with diabetes, macronutrient distribution should be individualized while keeping total caloric and metabolic goals in mind. So basically, what they are saying is that they have no recommendation on what percentage of fats, carbohydrates, and proteins that you should follow. They don't give one and they don't see a standout um, uh, way that would improve one or the other. Now, I, I, I don't entirely agree with that one, but I do agree that the number one thing that someone would need to do in order to um, reverse diabetes or to alleviate the symptoms of diabetes would be to lose weight and that is something that you can do on any macronutrient distribution range. So um, whether you're following a low fat diet, a low carb diet, or whatever, it, it really doesn't matter and I don't really advocate that you do any specific type of dieting um, other than that it's generally better that you rely on whole plant foods, those being fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts and seeds, and whole grains, and then that you also would do something like reduce your calorie intake. Um, so, you know, cut out sugar, oil, 
uh, refined foods like that, or at least cut down on the amount of them that you eat. And yes, that includes what people would perceive as healthy oils. They are still just, like olive oil, for example, is still a refined oil. It's 100 and some calories per tablespoon. So that's going to be the case no matter what kind of oil you eat. Olive oil might be healthier than another kind of oil, but they're both still just refined fat. So that's not necessarily a move in the right direction if you switch from using one type of oil to another. Uh, moving on, a second bullet point. A variety of eating patterns are acceptable for the management of type 2 diabetes and prediabetes, including the Mediterranean diet, DASH diet, and plant-based diets. Now, notice that they include plant-based diets in there. That's really kind of uh, neat, but also interesting because the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet are already diets that advocate increasing whole plant foods and decreasing animal-based foods. The Mediterranean diet being uh, this, uh, a very specific type of diet that came from the island of Crete when studied back in, I can't remember, sometime in the 19, mid-1900s there, 1950s, something like that. I, I can't remember exactly. But the diet was based largely around whole grains, um, a lot of it coming from bread, pasta, vegetables, very small amounts of meat and other animal products, very high in things like flax seeds that are very high in omega-3 fatty acids, and that kind of thing. So very good diet focused on whole grains and vegetables and legumes. They ate lots of lots, lots and lots of legumes. So those would be ideal uh, protein sources on that type of diet. Then the other type of diet mentioned, the DASH diet, is an acronym that stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And the cornerstones are increasing potassium intake through fruits and vegetables and decreasing sodium intake uh, in the form of table salt and that kind of thing. Or um, uh, So, so you, you can see that there's an emphasis on plant foods. Now, they do also include lean meats and... Um, low-fat dairy products. So there are some, you know, general ways that they are using to reduce overall body weight through caloric uh, manipulation. You're not going to be able to eat as much fruits, vegetables, and even if you're including lean meats and low-fat dairy, um, those foods as well as if you were eating Big Macs, cheeseburgers, steaks, and all these really high um, animal fatty foods. So even if you're only kind of partially following a plant-based diet, it's still going to get you a lot further than not following any kind of plant-based diet at all. So, moral of the story is eat more plant foods. But, again, moving on. Uh, carbohydrate intake from whole grains, vegetables, fruits, legumes, and dairy products with an emphasis on foods high in fiber, which would only include uh, the plant foods because dairy products don't have any fiber, um, and lower in glycemic load should be advised over other sources, especially those containing sugar. So they're basically telling you, eat more of these foods. Eat more fruits, vegetables, legumes. Eat less refined carbohydrate sources. Pretty simple, right? Cut out the sugar, cut out the pop. Um, it, instead of relying on fruit juices, notice they didn't include fruit juice in something. You want to kind of move away from that if you have type 2, if you have any type of diabetes, if you're trying to lose weight, those would be uh, foods that would kind of be generally good to stay away from, whereas uh, whole fruits like bananas, apples, oranges, grapes, any of those types of foods would be good to move towards. Um, now, uh, the last point in, under this section says, people with diabetes and those at risk should avoid sugar-sweetened beverages to control weight and reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and fatty disease and should minimize their consumption of foods with added sugar that have the capacity to displace healthier, more nutrient-dense foods. Now, there are several ways that um, sugary foods could potentially displace those foods. One would be that if you're just eating pies, cakes, and things like that, your, uh, your stomach's going to be full, so you're not going to have the desire to have those. But also in the sensory... Um, evaluation of your tongue, the way that you actually perceive taste. If you're eating a lot of those foods, then fruit's no longer going to taste very sweet to you anymore because 
Um, although uh, sugar, you know, fruit is sweet, it does have a, a, a certain amount of sugar in it. It's really small and it's combined with fiber and all these other really healthy things that, you know, those refined foods that I mentioned like cakes um, and sugary pies and things like that, they just don't have those things. Obviously, I'm not saying you should never eat those things. I like pie. I just had a piece of pie not more than five minutes before starting this video, but it should not be a large part of the diet. That's like one refined food that I've had over the course of this entire day. So, um, it, and I haven't had pie at all in several weeks. So, it's not something that you should never have or that you're just not allowed, but it's just something that shouldn't be a daily part of the diet. It should be a weekly treat or something like that. I had vegan pumpkin pie that my wife made using coconut milk rather than um, dairy cream, by the way. It was delicious. Uh, moving on to the next point, they cover several, um, they cover protein and dietary fats. So under the protein section, the one bullet point they have is that in, in, and I like this one, this is a really good point, in individuals with type 2 diabetes, ingested protein appears to increase insulin response without increasing plasma glucose concentrations. Therefore, because of that information, Carbohydrate sources high in protein should not be used to treat or prevent hypoglycemia. Now, hyperglycemia would be that your blood sugar is too high and you need it to come down. Whereas, you know, they're talking about, this is primarily gauged at nurses in this case, hypoglycemia, if someone's blood sugar is too low and you're using something that is fiber-containing, a um, fiber-containing, carbohydrate-containing protein like beans to try to bring their blood sugar up, which no nurse would probably ever think to do that. But... And nevertheless, they put the information in there. If they were using a carbohydrate-containing protein source like beans to try to increase uh, blood glucose levels, then that would be a really negative thing because it actually would likely not bring up their blood sugar and would might even cause it to go lower. So uh, that's also good to keep in mind, though, if you do have diabetes or you have hyperglycemia, is that those fiber carbohydrate-containing proteins like beans are so effective at actually bringing down blood sugar or at maintaining blood sugar at a healthy level that they are uh, counter uh, anti-recommended or counter-recommended, I don't know what the term for that is, um, to use if your blood sugar is low. So um, it kind of goes both ways. If your blood sugar is high, those would be great foods to integrate into your diet. Those would be good things to use if you have diabetes. Um, now, they also talk about dietary fat, and you guys can go read that. Um, they, you know, they recommend having more uh, fatty acids. They, they recommend fatty fish and nuts and seeds uh, to rec as a way to prevent cardiovascular disease. Obviously, I, I recommend that you, you, know, you kind of stay away from some of the uh, fish and that kind of thing. I, I, as a vegan, I would generally recommend that people eat more um, nuts and seeds, flax seeds is a great one, chia seeds is one that we use in a lot of cooking. I, I use it daily as um, kind of like an egg replacer. And uh, walnuts are a really great source, so those are kind of three good ones that you could go to. I'm trying to cut this video down, but... Um, and then I just covered page seven from the, the guide there, and if you look on, if you go to the website and read the article that I'll post, which will be in the description, description box below, then check out the page eight as well. It goes over exercise. Exercise is a huge component. The recommendation for adults is that you spend five days per week doing 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. So that would be like walking at a, at a high speed or um, biking, running, doing those, any swimming, anything that elevates your heart rate. Your heart rate does have to be elevated. So when people say, well, you know, I, I work and I, you know, I walk around a lot there, um, but their heart rate's not actually being elevated through the activity that they're doing at work, then it's probably not really actually going to have any effect at all on those aspects of preventing cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and improving overall heart health. And then, uh, so that's 150 minutes per week, 30 minutes, five days a week for adults. And then they also recommend that you do strength training two to three times per week. So um, load-bearing exercise like squats, presses, pulls, any of those kinds of things. Just something where you're bearing some kind of load is going to be a good idea. If you can't squat, 
Well, then um, doing things like belt squats where you actually, it, there's not a barbell on you, but you know maybe you put a belt on, uh, you could do leg press. There's all kinds of different things that you could do. Um, if you're not able to squat because of some kind of back injury, that's not a good excuse. There are plenty of other things that you could do. And if you can't do those things, then you are at a disadvantage, you're at a loss, you're not going to get a lot of the benefits of doing those exercises. So it really should be something that you should be trying to work around if you aren't able to do them under normal circumstances. And then the recommendation for children is that they actually do 60 minutes per day of activity, um, activity that actually elevates their heart rate, uh, as I described before, and um, that they also do load-bearing exercise of some form two to three days per week. So... Uh, that's the recommendations. Video is 15 minutes long now, so I'm going to cut it off there. You guys take it easy, and I will talk to you in that next video.